And the reason why you might, why necrophilia is just a fantastic word for it, mm -hmm. is because we endow certain objects with power, with our yeah. own power, with yeah. our own life. Mm -hmm. We give them life. And not to the point where they can replace us. Yeah, where they're actually alive. They're not but enough alive. to distract us, to entertain mm. us, and to um, detain us <laughs> <laughs> from realizing the death process and the death trap that we're engaging in so with powerful. ourselves. Welcome to the Veristruct podcast. Um, at this time, we want to invite you to just take a deep breath with us. <sighs> oh, great. Today, we're talking about Veristruct future. Um, a little bit about Veristruct, it's a neologism, and that means it's a new word that helps to describe um, what life is supposed to be for humans. Um, life has changed so much, and uh, it's almost like we need a new, completely new take on life to even feel like it's worth going back to a, a more natural lifestyle. And it's so funny how, I, I think there is actually a really huge movement in natural living right now, but natural has become one of those hijacked words. And that's all, almost one of the reasons why we are so grateful that we have this word veristruct that we've created because I think it's, it can be even used as a replacement for natural, the correct way of natural living. So veristruct is an interesting word because it's, it's both a verb, mm -hmm. an adjective, and a noun. Right. So when you say a veristruct future, you're referring to either the noun or the adjective, right? It is, it is a, it, the future is veristruct, in both senses of that of that phrase, right? Right. Here's one of the issues with the whole idea of a very strict future is because the main version of the word is a verb. Mm -hmm. You can't have something that can be wholly defined as very strict. In fact, if you were to wholly define it as very strict, very strict isn't a word you use anymore. Um, why is that? Well, quite frankly, because if we're all living the way that we're supposed to, you don't need to be thinking of the ways in which to live. You don't even need to be meta about it. Yeah, that's true. You don't need to get into the metaphorical or into the conceptual to just live correctly. Mm -hmm. Which is why sometimes we have this, you know, we have this belief we don't know precisely um, though I think the evidence is actually in the contrary that sometimes we go, hey, the past was better. Right. Because there was less humanism, there was less this structure mm -hmm. that um, has been built over for millennia, um, which teaches us not to be natural, not yeah. to be very struct. But that's not entirely accurate. We find that humanism is a problem always. And that's yeah. another... That's another roadblock to a Veristruct future. Humanism is going to continue to be a problem. Or rather, I should, the necrophilia um, that is inherent in humanism, this idea that we love dead things more than living things, including holding people hostage to their ideas mm. or to our own ideas, rather than willing to let them be individual beings who change, who are capricious, and that's a good thing. Wonderful. Who can be instinctual mm -hmm. and can make decisions on the fly that maybe even doesn't make sense by their own logic system. So what is a Veristruct future? Well, if we actually get there, the word Veristruct no longer 
exists, and to some degree, not even the word future either. Because yeah. Verstruct, I think, has this fun has this fun play between the past and the future, uh-huh. where it totally negates the present. Yeah, and it becomes this this thing where the past and the future are are not defined, and so time as a whole still moves forward. Right, but it's it doesn't care as much about when things are or yeah. where things are on the timeline. Yeah. So, Verestruck future, we don't use the term Verestruck anymore. Plus, humanism is probably going to continue being a thing. Oh, I think I think it's always going to be a thing in the same way that pride is always going to be a roadblock in human development and the um the pers- in the pursuit of morality and ethical living i think pride is always going to be a roadblock and i think that's the root feeling behind humanism right. is pride pride in humanity or yeah. in humans or rather human thinking yep yep so I think that'll always be a roadblock. Um, I like that you did say that Verestruct would maybe not be a word that will be used anymore. And no. the reason I really like that is because I've seen the harm that words can do, right. unfortunately. There's been, um, in 2021, as we're talking, um, just in this past year, we have seen an abundance of words that should mean one thing become something entirely new. Um, this has been happening for centuries, right, too. Right, that's true, that's true. But I, I feel like I've seen it especially in the past year. But, um, you know, businesses, governments, organizations, culture, because you could even argue the creation of language in the first place was a destruction of meaning, mm. of truth. Yeah. Because instead of interacting with the real world, uh-huh. you created language to, to be a symbol, to be an icon, mm. to be a derivative of that real, real world, and then you could interact with the derivative of that real world. Yeah. And then we've just gone more and more meta, you know, with mm-hmm. with uh, the written word than with all sorts of different technologies that have taken language to new heights. Yeah. But have probably disconnected us even further from the real, real world. Yeah. And even in these um, very specific, you know, there's a lot of general words that are being abused, but even in these very specific terms, for example, um, I'm very involved in the birth world, and free birth, for example, is a term that is widely argued to mean many different things, actually, and everyone's trying to define what it actually means, and we're spending so much time trying to define this word and not actually thinking about what it means to just give birth in general in the way that you want to do it. So, um, and that's the problem that you'll see with the Verestruck future. Yep. Uh, this twisting of all words will occur with Verestruck. So the only safeguard that we have is to try and put as much literature out there as possible saying, this is Verestruck, this is not. yeah. Yeah. And we can get into that about what are some of the examples likely pitfalls yeah of verestruct but this is this is a safeguard is to go this is a future this is not another thing that might change the future is if you are religious if you do believe in some kind of source some kind of a um The spiritual becomes physical moment, Mm, mm -hmm. Um, whether you believe in the return of uh, Muhammad or uh, Jesus Christ, or you believe in some other kind of uh, religious awakening across the entire world. 
Mm -hmm. That would be a moment where Verstruct would cease to be as important. Right. Um, that would supersede it. Um, I think spirituality will definitely, at some point, supersede the physical, which does indeed include all living things. Now, Verstruck does does indicate a higher plane of understanding mm -hmm. and of truth. So, you, so this is why we call it sometimes a terrestrial metaphysics or a terrestrial philosophy. Right. Terra meaning of the earth, terrestrial meaning of the earth, terra meaning earth in Latin. Mm -hmm. And verstruct also is Latin for truth build, as we've probably discussed here before. So what we see here is that there's such thing as a celestial, which is uh, in many cases and in our you know our own religion is considered a higher form of truth and sometimes you can refer to the sun as being the source of truth you see that with platonic um, metaphysics the sun is literally a higher truth so and that would be a celestial body right right so we call it a terrestrial metaphysics because it doesn't matter whether you believe in nothing higher than Verstruct, mm -hmm. or you do. It doesn't matter. Now, Verstruct seems to indicate there is something there. Indeed. Um, but it doesn't really care. Right. Um, you can be of any particular religion or no religion, mm -hmm. and it applies, and it functions, and it works. Not in the next life, in this life. So that's why it's so effective. And that's why it's important that it's a verb. Because it isn't the end all, be all of no. truth. It is truth building. It is Beautiful. trying to get as much truth as you can. You could almost say this is what science was intended to be. I love that. Which is grasping at reality as opposed to just what we're what we observe. Observation of intervention. Um, or just even extremely flawed observation of reality with the intent to create something new out of it. Correct. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely love that comment about Verstruct. It really is a consistent pursuit of um, building truth rather than finding, um, finding ways to intervene or to um, change the natural construct that is. Um, I think we are seeing with science that it is on a trajectory where it is done with the intent to change things and not to nurture. Yeah, I, I don't really care much about about science at this point yeah and I think those who are still engaging in proper science I applaud them absolutely but that that doesn't have a lot of play in a very stark future right um, because if you're dealing with dead things you're dealing with dead things if you're dealing with living beings you're dealing with living beings that is the binary of very struct yeah. And that is the definition of whether you are very structing or not. Are you engaging with more living beings or more dead things? So, and that's why we call it necrophilia to some degree. The humanism yeah. is necrophilia because we do have this obsession with dead things. We like killing things. It's easier to control them, easier to engage with them. Our ideas are built to try and funnel people into a death trap so, yeah. that, so that they're easier to control. So... We need to get away from that. We need to stop loving death, and we need to start loving life. And that is such... This is a visual that we'll often talk about, or a paradigm shift that we'll often talk about with Verstruck, because it's so incredibly powerful mm -hmm. to realize that we are indeed in these dead boxes and surrounded by all these dead <laughs> items that have been so um, intently constructed for our luxury <laughs> well and it's and it's scary because yeah. uh, and the reason why you might why necrophilia is just a fantastic word for it mm -hmm. is because we endow certain objects with power with our yeah. own power with yeah. our own life 
-hmm. We give them life. And not to the point where they can replace us. Yeah, where they're actually alive. They're not but enough to alive. distract us, to entertain mm -hmm. us, and to um, detain us <laughs> <laughs> from realizing the death process and the death trap that we're engaging in so with powerful. ourselves. So that's why we invite people to breathe, take a deep breath, and um, continue to breathe deeply as we go through these topics because media like this mm -hmm. um, is very good at distracting us from what's going on with our bodies. Yeah. To forget that we need water. To forget that we need food. Right. And um, to avoid the sun. I mean, we create... It's very likely that right now, those who are, you know, listening to this, ourselves, as we're sitting here, yeah. we have miniature suns, which are distracting us from the actual sun. Yeah. And we even cover the sun. Like, I, I really think it's important that we do not create a boundary between us and the sun. Ceilings, yeah. ceilings and roofs are our downfall. They're yeah. disconnecting us from the main energy source of this solar system. Of, of life in yeah. general. And, and I, I, really, I really like that. And I'm, I'm sure that people who are listening, you know, they might be wondering how to escape these dead boxes because we are so tethered to them. We are used to them. You and I, we still live in a dead box. <laughs> well, and but we have... And we've been slowly killing everything outside of them, too, at the same time. Indeed, which is... Or wow. even quickly killing them. Indeed. Um, but I guess what the question I'm trying to get to is I, I want to know more about living houses and talk about what that looks like. Um, how does a living house work, do you think? Because this is only a theory that we've kind of created. So the theory is essentially this. How many years have we been spending on humanist endeavors? Thousands. Thousands, uh, maybe even hundreds of thousands of years, um, depending on your you know, belief and your perspective about um, history. Indeed. And uh, carbon dating and all that. Right. I, I don't want to get into that. But regardless, certainly humanism has been a facet of human life since the beginning. Mm -hmm. So we are inviting you to do something that's been done before, actually. A yeah. whole lot. This that's, is this is new. Yeah, it's a future. It's a future kind of endeavor. It's not one of those. Oh, let's. This is, this isn't necessarily ancestral wisdom. Yeah, it's not. I think that can be helpful. Right. And I think. That is a great um, stepping point to go. Absolutely. I do think we know things through the modern humanist methods uh -huh. that can be helpful. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not so pessimistic, pessimistic as to think that all of human history has been a waste. Indeed. But imagine if we had spent those hundreds of thousands of years uh -huh. instead of using rocks, then brass, then iron, right. however you want to construct history, but regardless, we have been using tools and technology, dead things that we can control, that do not make choices. We make the choices for the dead object, but instead we were willing to deal with the, I'll be honest, sometimes messy, sometimes complicated business of interacting, cooperating, and engaging with other living beings. Mm -hmm. Sometimes have decisions that we don't like. So imagine if we had spent hundreds of thousands of years, instead of building skyscrapers, what would we be doing now? After hundreds of thousands of years of the messy, complicated business of cooperating with living beings. Right. I. It's just a theory, but I would argue, and I hope that the next couple hundred thousand years are devoted to this, I doubt it, mm -hmm. but I can always hope, and this is what we're trying to persuade people to do, is 
Is it possible that by this point in history, this point in time, or 100,000 years from now, there will be living airplanes? Right. Airplanes that use no metal, that are completely living. Right. And we are able to fly in this living being. And of course, there's the, that would be very fascinating. And of course, we don't have many ideas for that other than the idea that we'd be spending a lot more time in living structures. But it is. We are not a hundred thousand years of people right. devoting their time and energy to something. Right. So we can't come up with that on the spot. No. That's why it's a theory. Right. I think it's a pretty sound theory, though. Right. So what can we imagine achieving pretty quickly and would be more helpful is houses. Absolutely. That's that something that we've said a lot. We, um, we like to give out plants um, to people to help clean the air in their homes. And one of the reasons why we specifically give it out to just citizens, civilians, rather than, you know, big businesses or anything like that, or planting trees outside is because we do believe that most people are spending most of their time in the home. Um, that's where they're breathing most of their air. Or indoors. Indoors. Um, so, start in the home. That's where some of the most valuable work starts is in the home so that's our free plants for all initiative right and uh, you can find you know whatever what other funding method we're using nowadays um hopefully we'll have all sorts of venues and different channels that you can go to where you can donate and where you can get plants for yourself um, so we highly recommend looking into that if you haven't heard about it and uh, participating in that and that will be in our in the description below if you're on youtube or um, in the show notes if you're on the podcast and hopefully that is a facet of a very stroke future right is this free plants for all initiative yeah we feel like that's a very logical um method of outreach for yeah. struct it's one thing to talk about it it's another thing to act on it and to give this act of service and then invite others to donate and to pay participate. it forward that's been that's been a really special part of all of this um being able to if need be give somebody a plant completely for free and you know maybe they don't donate and that's perfectly fine because we're happy for them to have the plant but mm -hmm. the next person will maybe donate ten dollars and that kind of pays for the other person's plant and so it's it's been really wonderful to witness and yeah people's generosity is fantastic and what better way to replenish the plant population that's another thing that we hope for the future mm -hmm. is um, plants the plants of the world become more and more private property. Yeah. And more and more people take responsibility for that private property that um, I feel responsible for anything that I consume and whatever toxins that might put into the air. I feel responsible for that to the point where I maintain plants and I am trying to produce whatever I can mm -hmm. in a sustainable, truly sustainable right. method um, on my own property, yeah. with my own property. Yeah. That's a very struck future that we envisage, 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 envision. <laughs> um, but that's something that we look forward to and we hope Free Plants for All will help people to achieve that. And hopefully what we can do, Veristruct shares the root word with destruct and construct. Uh -huh. And we hope we'll stop constructing so that we don't have to destruct. That we start actually um, building, quote unquote, mm -hmm. 
um, by cooperating with life. Absolutely. And encouraging them to grow in particular ways that they can live a good, happy life whether that be trees or whatever it might be. And we have various ideas of how to achieve this. Yeah. And hopefully in the future, um, if you're listening to this, there are living structures, living buildings, living homes that you can occupy that we have, for, for lack of a better word, developed. But the better word is grown. Ver- verestructed. Verestructed or grown. That don't require destruction. Yeah. If if you are unable to occupy it any longer and it must be abandoned, then it will have absolutely no negative impact on the environment around it and require no decomposition other than the natural decomposition of any forest that might be there, any plants, you know, you know, whatever form of plant might be there. Yeah you don't leave behind anything and that you could have infinite nearly infinite plant structures and it would have no negative effect on the air quality and the soil quality um, and the water quality absolutely and the food quality because they're all related right right Um, something that I'm thinking of now as well in terms of what a verestruct future might look like is, you know, we we all know that the population of the world is growing quite rapidly. And I think- It's slowing down. Oh, well, hey, it's slowing down. (laughs) It's growing rapidly, I guess, in specific places. That's something that you and I have discussed. As it's decreasing in other places. Yeah. yeah. And Um, eventually we'll hit an equilibrium um, depends on the specialist that you talk to. Right. But almost everyone agrees that it's the world population is going to top out at 11 billion. Okay. In about a hundred years from now. Well, and and the reason why that's so sad mm-hmm. is because that's way lower than the capacity of this planet. Right. With humans and plants. So the only reason why we're topping off at that level is because we don't have an appreciation for life. Yeah. Like we should. It's so true. It's so true. And we, we know that this is true because of we, we know how much property, for lack, you know, lack of a better word, which would definitely be land or earth that is available to humans. There is so much available to humans and it's not being used efficiently. And I think in a very struct world, um, or a very struct future, I suppose, land would be used efficiently to the point that everybody could have access to property where they can grow their own food, grow their own house, um, and not have to live on top of each other in buildings, not having to live in these cramped neighborhoods. And of course, yeah, there's a lot. Nest. And of course, there's a lot to say about. Um, you know, where all the waste goes after, you know, a neighborhood is taken down. And, and that's, that's one of the consequences of humanism. And that's why we would love to see homes in the future being grown. Because yeah, all of these houses, even these, this beautiful, you know, new home that we're in right now, that was recently built, um, someday it's going to get very, very old and maybe nobody's going to want to live in it and the waste is going to have to go somewhere right and that's kind of heartbreaking yeah Uh i'm I'm sure we've said this before and we'll say it a hundred times again we we can't keep building things um as if they're going to last forever yeah and uh who knows what reason we might eventually not want it anymore. <laughs> but no matter what that reason might be, even if it's a building that that's not trendy, that is somehow timeless, it's going to be abandoned eventually. And uh, 
those products that we left in it, and that, and that's not, and that's not including the devices that we have. That's mm -hmm. not including the other technology that we have, the vehicles that we have. All of these have products in them that are made to last forever. Yeah. But the structure that they create <laughs> will not. And we don't wow. want it to last forever. And in fact, we have a culture of wanting the next best thing within a year, two, three, five, ten, twenty years. It's similar. Very little makes it past fifty. Right. Well, that's similarly to. Um, I remember we were recently talking about the light bulb, and how the light bulb actually, the, it was um, invented at one point. Someone invented. A light bulb that could last for a very very long time years and years and years the problem was that if they sold a light bulb that lasted for years and years and years nobody would come back to buy any and so they had to all the companies got together and made an agreement on how long their light bulbs will last so that they can keep making money um, so yeah why why are our structures not lasting forever and you know, and, and I do think, like you said, I, I do think that things are not supposed to last forever, especially man-made items. I don't think that's meant to happen. But, but yeah, all of these dead boxes that we're li living in are going to look a lot more dead, that's for sure, than they do now um, in just a matter of years. And And what then? And, of course... You know, we, the earth is going to do wonderfully without us, regardless of um, how much we abuse the earth. But we still, we're, we, we believe that as verisructors, we're stewards, and as humans, we're stewards of this earth. It's absolutely worth it to take care of the earth um, so that humanity can thrive and that connection with the earth helps us to um, prosper as a race. That was a little rant, but there it is. There you go. So another thing we need to define sure. is think about Verastruck future. Uh huh. So we already talked about the Verastruck part. What, what does future even mean? Talk mm. about recent future, far future, distant future. I definitely see growing structures as a possible soon future, you know? Right. Um, may, maybe within our lifetime. Yeah. Could have quite, quite a few. That's the hope. Um, far future with Verastruct, hopefully it gets outmoded before it gets twisted. Mm -hmm. um, and why is that? Well, because we've already seen in history a few examples of ideologies, of philosophies that are were close enough to Verestruct to mm -hmm. cause, at least me, cause me some worry. Mm. And uh, one great example of that is uh, ethno-environmentalism. Mm -hmm. Um, you see, especially with the Nazi theory, blood and soil, mm -hmm. um, or in the German, blut and Bolden, mm -hmm. um, you find this idea that we humans, um, we humans increase the value of a place. Right. Um, when a culture is created, and just a quick aside, um, that's one of the reasons why culture is named that way is because it mimics, it's a metaphorical, it's a derivative of true culture, which is agriculture, mm -hmm. but not even agriculture, it's uh, <laughs> permaculture, right? Right. So we have this word culture and it's become conceptualized it's become killed. It's been murdered to become a concept. Indeed. That actually is 
in the case of Bluton Bowden, literally the thing that kills actual culture. Because in the end, what's the whole point of actual culture of plants? Is they are to benefit individuals. And as they benefit individuals, they also benefit the world. So there's no reason for, for you to make a connection between plants or the earth and a group. Mm -hmm. Never. Um, and this is something that the Nazis clearly got wrong. Right. Um, uh, not to get too much into this, but this is why they thought one of the justifications for why the Jews were no good. Mm. Because they wanted to live in Israel, not mm -hmm. in Germany. Um, and that was considered a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So, first and foremost, stated right here for everyone to know, Verstruct is against this. Mm -hmm. Why is it against it, though? This is important to realize. Very few people actually refute Nazi theory. Mm -hmm. um, one of the reasons why is because it's incredibly difficult to do so. It actually is quite logically sound. Um, in this case, though, the, the, the part that is not logical about this theory, that Verestruct is very much for, uh, very much against, I should say, uh -huh. is the idea that there is any superiority to be had. Mm -hmm. Um, superiority, if it exists, is natural mm -hmm. and therefore requires no outside influence, no artificial influence. Mm -hmm. What does this mean? It means that decisions that you make mm -hmm. either have direct consequences for them mm -hmm. or else nothing. Or else you are creating artificial consequences. You're trying to force, you're trying to pigeonhole, you're trying to shove a square peg into a round hole. Right. And there's going to be lasting consequences for yourself and for others. Uh huh. Um, I, I do not think, I do not think those who understood this theory of Blut and Bowden um, had a good life. And uh, was the life of those they oppressed worse than theirs? Yes. No, no one had a good time with this. It is not a theory which has a lot of positive consequences. Right. So if you are arguing, hey, my idea is right and I'm going to push for it, then your idea is not right and it's evil and it's wrong. Mm -hmm. The only way to do that is with a group is with, and this is what we're seeing a lot nowadays, and it's surprising that we're not talking about this more, but currently we are seeing a huge push for a type of Bluton Bowden on a global scale, which is all global people have to tie themselves to the global environment. If they do not, they are lesser, inferior citizens of the world mm -hmm. and must be punished. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite eerie how similar it is. This Nazi theory and current globalist talking points. They're pretty much exactly the same. Mm. So Verstruck is very much against globalism um, and very much against any kind of groupism. Individuals are born unique and should remain unique. Um, that is messy, yes, makes things complicated, makes it hard to create laws and to create unity uh, among different people. But um, we don't create unity by forcing people to be a certain way, by holding them hostage to our ideas. Another worry of mine is hedonism. Um, Many people say this is the downfall of the Roman Empire. I think it's a little more complicated than that. Um, certainly, humanism was an issue <laughs> in the downfall of the Roman Empire. Perhaps that's even better way to describe it. Hedonism just happened to be a very specific example, which is seeking the pleasures of the body. Mm. 
the reason why this one is a worry of mine is because there is a lot of language that we have put out um, essentially saying that yes you should be trying to not pleasure the body but keep it healthy be aware of the body mm, see how it's feeling like and the reason why that's different and this one's a little more complicated to describe but essentially we are looking for long-term uh, positive effects mm -hmm. um, that's a hard thing for people of a humanist perspective, especially a scientific perspective, to grasp. Right. We're not looking at the consequences of five years or a 10-year study or a 20-year study. We're looking at a 1,000-year study. Right. What has worked for humans a 1,000 years ago mm -hmm. has, we have no reason to believe is bad today. And we have no reason to believe that as we learn and gain new technologies or whatever it might be, or become more verestruct, hopefully, that we'll have any reason to believe that it's not good to right. do. Right. And we know what these are. Um, there, there's quite a bit of literature, quite a bit of history with herbs and their effectiveness and various foods and their effectiveness in curing certain not curing, but certainly making certain ail ailments more pleasant mm -hmm. and making our daily lives more enjoyable. Um, these are both medicines and um, I don't even know what the term is, nutrition. It's nutrition and medicine at the same time, mm -hmm. depending on whatever situation you're in, whether you have an ailment or you don't. They are beneficial, period. Um, the old saying goes, you feed a fever but starve a cold, and and now we're finding out it's feed a fever and feed a cold. It's feed everything. Food is good. Not all food is helpful in all cases, but there's always food that is helpful. Indeed. Um, so, so this idea that, yes, healthy food is pleasurable. Mm-hmm. Healthy water is pleasurable. But the kind of pleasure discussed very often with hedonism is a temporary pleasure. Right. It is a fleeting pleasure. And it is a self-destructive pleasure. In the end, the type of pleasure we're talking about is precisely the kind that ne necrophiliacs are into. Mm -hmm. It is a destruction of the body. Um, very often when someone is hedonist, uh, hedonist in this modern culture, you mm -hmm. will find that they like drugs. And these drugs create an effect in the body. How? By smushing it, by breaking it apart, by destroying it. Right. And um, these people are actively seeking out these destructive chemicals, these destructive toxins. Right. And it's self-destructive behavior. But, and, and yeah, what's so eerie about that is that that's not actually much different from what the average human is doing these days right? in the Western world. It's not much different, only, you know, there's different, there, it's framed differently. It's advertised differently. Different correct? drugs. You've got... Right metaphysical drugs like social media yeah um, you've got conceptual drugs like most learning these days <laughs> um, it's merely a distraction in the end um, Verestruct would invite us to question whether something leads us quicker and more and, and allows us to engage more with life and with living beings mm -hmm. and if it does not to say that is that is humanist and hedonism as it is normally described is absolutely that it is a distraction from actual life it is to try and destroy our own bodies and the bodies of others often it is it is not a sustainer of life. It is not looking to engage. It's not looking to go towards life and living beings. Right.
And something that I'm, you mentioned, you know, learning and how it's very flawed um, right now and rather um, a toxic drug even. And what, and what you mean by learning is um, sophistry um, based education a lot of the time. I, I think to some degree all learning. Interesting. Mm -hmm. That's why we invented, uh, that's why I invented the word verstruct. Right. It's to essentially say, okay, let's use this tool that we've developed for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, and let's see if we can get it to show its own flaws. Right. And take a look at its own weaknesses, mm -hmm. and then focus us on something entirely different. Mm. So when we are finally focused on that thing, Verstuck ceases to be uh, a word. It ceases to be important. Right. Well, and so what I wanted to address about learning really quick is that in the future, one of my hopes, and maybe this is more of a short-term goal rather than a super long-term, because I, I do hope that... Um, that people will just simply base their lives off of reality rather than human constructs. But I do hope that the way that we engage with information changes as if, you know, there's a more very sharp future that when you engage with information, you're looking at it like, this is commentary on the current human condition or perhaps the past or perhaps the future trajectory, right? You're looking at it as this is where humans are right now. If this is widely maybe accepted or distributed information, this is where humans are right now. You're not thinking this is the truth right now or this is cutting edge um, findings that you know are made by the best minds in the world so it has to be you know correct or it's the best we have right um it's so interesting that people assume that just because it's new and just because it's quote unquote the best we have um that it's going to be beneficial or there's going to be few consequences from that um and so i'm hoping that people will view information simply as information and not feel a need to tether themselves to that information and act so much more on intuition. I, I think I, I have found that my intuition um, is very much pulled when, when I untether myself from all the worldly information that I'm looking at, I do tend to focus more on actual life you take away all of the human made stuff and what do you have? You have life every time. Yeah, that's the difficult part is to some degree we are born and to some degree you could say it's natural to be humanist. Yeah. So we do need a, a process, a, an idea, a philosophy, um, a, did I say process, a process? Yeah. For disregarding that, disregarding that part, right. because to and engaging in the rest. Because to a we certain we are degree, dual beings. Right. I'm. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm just thinking about how. I mean, a lot of that I think is just survival instinct, right? We're like, how can we make our living situation more optimal? And that's where you know humanism started is okay it's raining on us we can't find any shelter from the rain we don't like being covered in rain let's create a structure right and from there it continued <laughs> and you know creating a structure is pretty reasonable in my opinion um, of course growing a structure is even better <laughs> but that's what you know we had at that time or, you know, that humans were thinking of at that time. But 
yeah, to a certain degree, I think it's a survival instinct that we shouldn't be using so much. It is pride, and that's where the pride sneaks in. There's a survival instinct where how can I live more safely, more efficiently, but then there's the pride that sneaks in and says, oh, how can I change things? How can I fix all these problems that maybe aren't even problems? Um, how can I gain control of other people? How can I gain control of situations? And that's another thing it stems from in addition to the pride. It stems from the need for control over the environment, over, over other people, over um, natural problems that so much of the time, almost every time, have natural positive solutions. So to recap, um, there, there may be a point where the word bearish drug is no longer applicable, whether because... Maybe, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I know, I know where you're going with this. Go ahead. Whether because um, we, have a we have achieved some kind of bearish drug future that is very bearish drug, mm -hmm. where the verb is no longer necessary. Right. You just need to live. Right. Um, maybe there's a better word at that point, like grow or flow, um, a word that implies movement, but that doesn't imply speed, acceleration, or whether it gets superseded by some kind of spiritual event that is worldwide. Right. Also, we need to define what does future mean? And Certainly, Verestruct um, should achieve some level of, of recognition um, before it becomes twisted. And if it is to become twisted, we can say with certainty right now, um, you should be looking out for hedonism, for ethno-environmentalism, and there are other things as well, such as um, being against technology, being a Luddite, and uh, other such problems which might crop up and are wholly anti verstruct So we have that, but hopefully in the future we see more of free plants for all and we see living structures being a thing in the future. And the reason, um, just to say that again, just to reiterate this, the reason that these living structures are so important and um, everyone having an abundance of plants in their home is so important is because truly the earth's plant population is very very low and not only are these plants here on this earth to clean our air and provide us food but because they are alive they are providing us with a certain degree of connection it's reminding us of mm -hmm. life. It's mentally healing. It's spiritually healing to have these plants near you. And so, yeah, it's interdimensionality, right? Yeah. It's this idea that we, all living beings, are made up of more than three dimensions. Absolutely. And that we're constantly engaging with these higher dimensions, but we don't know it. Yeah. And the best way to realize what's actually going on is to engage with other living beings. Not Absolutely. the best way, one of the best ways. The other way is to get direct information from those other dimensions, which is why spirituality continues to be an important thing. Yeah. So, there you go. All very important. We, we really do hope that Verestruct has a future in this world. We see it as such a valuable um, philosophy and we're grateful to be the keepers of it. So long as we continue to have a Verestruct online community, we invite you to participate in that. Um, that is currently being offered by Mighty Networks. Um, we will have a link in the description or in the notes. Um, please participate in Free Plans for All. And 
We thank you for listening today. Um, and I would like to invite anybody who is able that after listening to this, you go outside and feel the sun on your face if you can and get some nourishing food, take some deep breaths and drink some clean water. Thank you so much. You are a deep fountain of unique identity, Vera Structure. Have a lovely day.